Modifying Pico points. Why, I hear you ask. Well, let me ask a question. How many of you are DCC and use these little clips? Well, this is me taking that concept just a little bit further. Before we do any modifying though, I'd just like to refer back to my previous video where we established no matter whether we're DC analog or DCC, we established that there's two wires that come out of our base unit and we attach those to the track. One on the left rail, one on the right rail. I use red and black wires as colour coordination. So with some of my super high tech graphics, I'm going to try and explain what's going on. We've got our red and black rails and then if we draw a point in, you can see there's a conflict between red and black on the frog. And that isn't good, which is why the manufacturers put a little plastic insert to keep the two rails apart. And they're connected underneath by two thin wires, connecting each of the two different rails via the frog underneath. For 90% of the time, this isn't a problem. And sometimes we can use it to our advantage. On small or simple railways, we can use the point as an electrical switch when the blade isn't touching the stock rail, creating an electrical gap, which means we can isolate a train on one part of the point. This relies heavily on the contact area between the blade and the stock rail. If the blade isn't clean or the stock rail isn't clean or there's a tiny little bit of grit, that will be enough to stop the continuity of electrical contact. To overcome this, we could just drop our little clip back in. But this has the same contact issues, especially if we want to paint and weather our rails. My solution to this is similar to one that we saw in the last video on basic wiring, is to chop out some plastic on the underside of the point, exposing the bare rails, and then soldering a wire across the two rails, permanently bonding them electrically. And then like before, in the basic wiring video, we can drop our wires through the baseboard, attach them to the bus wire, and they are virtually invisible. This is fine for set track. Because of the sharp diverging route, the plastic insert in the frog is rather large, especially on Hornby points, because the plastic piece on those ones is ginormous. However, on streamline points, this does cause some problems. Because the diverging route is a shallower angle, the plastic piece in the frog is a lot thinner. On some stock and locomotives, the wheel profiles are quite steep, which means there isn't really a problem. On the other hand, some wheel sets are really flat and they will contact both sides of the plastic piece, enabling a short, especially on DCC railways. There's probably a couple of different ways that this can be solved. The most intriguing that I've heard of is the use of nail varnish on the frog area. Probably the easiest solution is to introduce two plastic rail joiners, but this is still reliant on the contact between the blade and the stock rail. Me personally, I like to isolate the frog completely electrically, creating another electrical zone. There's two ways of doing this, and it depends which type of point you're using, either electrofrog or insole frog. We'll take a look at an electrofrog point first. First thing to note is this extra wire on the frog area. Uh, you can use this, but I prefer to not to. More of that in a moment. Secondly, these come with a pre-cut joint in the rail, electrically bonded underneath with a short length of wire. We don't need this at all, so we're going to remove it. That's easily done with a screwdriver, and you just ping it out. Sometimes they're a little stubborn, but most of the time they just ping right off. With those pinged out of the way, that's created our separate electrical section within the point. And we isolate it at the other end using our friend 
the plastic rail joiner. Now on our inshore frog point, the one with the plastic insert, we do this in a slightly different way. Underneath we see the bonding wire underneath. Now on this point we're going to remove that as well. And we can do that with a blade or a thin screwdriver. Once you've taken the slack out they normally just spring out. With those out of the way we've effectively isolated on screen the left hand side of the point and the right hand side of the point. Come back to this end in a minute. We'll divert our attention to the, the stock rail and the blade. Now that we've isolated it at one end we can effectively join these rails together on one side. First by chopping a piece of the plastic out underneath the rail if necessary and then dropping a, drop, a blob of solder on the bottom of the rail ready to take our wire which is first tinned and then soldered across two of the rails permanently bonding a stock rail and blade rail electrically. Again this makes it much easier to camouflage the wires once the point is installed on the layout. Let's go back up to the nose or frog as I'd like to call it and we'll do the same with the two rails that emanate from it. First by chopping a piece of plastic out underneath the rail, soldering a blob and then tinning and attaching a blue wire this time. Why blue? Well it's almost a Schrodinger wire. It sometimes has to be red, sometimes has to be black. I just like to keep everything colour coordinated. This is just another part of that. Right, here comes the difficult bit. Well at least I don't have to do it over the telephone with no visual aids. Right, our best friend now is our point motor with auxiliary switch. And that doesn't matter whether it's a tortoise, cobalt, seep or pico. So long as it's got an auxiliary switch on it, it'll work. But as you know, I like to build my own point motors these days. And it works just as well as any one that you can buy off the shelf. Once our point has been installed on our railway, we drill some holes next to the wires that have, we've soldered underneath. Pull them through and then attach them to our bus wires. What about our Schrodinger wire, the blue one, that sometimes has to be red and sometimes has to be black? Well, that gets soldered to the common spike on the auxiliary switch. Now, I call it an auxiliary switch because that's what it is on a point motor. Um, but basically, it's just a micro switch and they're all the same. They'll have three terminals coming out of the bottom. One is what I call the common then the next one is called the normally closed and the other one is called normally open. There's all variations of different explanations of them online and these are the ones that I like because they're relatively cheap and it goes with my skin flint nature. So at the moment our point is set so that the red rail needs to be connected to the frog. So that means we connect our red wire off of our bus wire onto the connection on the auxiliary switch that is normally closed. The remaining terminal on the auxiliary switch gets connected to the black wire via the black bus wire. The motion of our point motor, whichever one you have, will then operate the auxiliary switch, flipping the electrical power from one side to the other side. Hopefully I've made it obvious that you'll need two plastic rail joiners connected to the frog as well and then two uh, feeds connected to your bus rail. I'm hopeful that I've not made a complete pig's ear of this and it's sort of understandable in under 10 minutes as well which is a bonus. My layout is undergoing a bit of a rebuild and I'm started with the fiddle yard storage area underneath of which I've already installed some of my point motors. Next time we'll look at these ones that have got two auxiliary switches on them and what we can do with them. In the meantime, thanks for watching. See you next time.